can alike change the world. Not if you listen to the people currently in power. The UN defines collectivism as supporting a cause by performing simple measures, not necessarily engaged or devoted to making a change. The Urban Dictionary defines slacktivism, as they call it, as the self-deluded idea that by liking, sharing or retweeting something, you're helping out. They basically imply that if it's simple, you're not committed. If you're not at a protest, homemade banner in hand, you will not contribute to change. But beyond this limited definition of collectivism, what does it actually mean? Collectivism can be any form of online social activism. Social change hashtags, viral videos, LGBTQ Snapchat filters or online petitions. These are already a staple of how Generation Z bring about change. But how do we answer the claim that it's simply a means of appeasing our conscious? Are we truly engaging with the matter at hand? There is mounting evidence to suggest that online activism is far more effective than many assume. Research over the last 10 years suggests that collectivism can be a powerful tool to spread little known ideas and publicize non-mainstream causes that don't get the attention they deserve. One tweet or post won't change the world, of course, but thousands of them can spread beliefs that will. There is a reason that traditional media gatekeepers tell us that social media can't make a difference. By creating movements online, these traditional gatekeepers simply get shut out. Injustices which have persisted for decades are suddenly getting traction because a wider group of people now get a say in the agenda. And collectivism has a major role to play in carving out this alternative narrative. Amazing things happen when collective, unified digital efforts emerge. We've seen policies changed, we've seen cultures turn, we've seen the powerful end up in prison, and we've even seen governments fall. Perhaps the most obvious question to ask is, how has the internet become the platform for mediating change at scale? Well, like any situation, it's a good idea to look at both sides. A year-long pandemic has taught us to live online, so it's unsurprising that social media campaigns were the spark for street protests and rallies in summer 2020. On the 25th of May last year, the murder of George Floyd incited local protest. Three nights later, the whole world's feeds streamed with live pictures of protesters burning Minneapolis' third police precinct. These local uprisings reached millions who shared in the pain. Then, in June, protests expanded at an unprecedented speed and scale, growing nationally, then internationally, leaving a series of now iconic images and videos in their wake. Major historical events are often linked to the technology of the day. Television footage from Selma changed attitudes around the world. Radios united countries in World War I, and even the printing press sparked riots. What we're witnessing now feels like an exceptionally online moment of social unrest. Critics argue that collectivism doesn't lead to actual change, and that it oversimplifies complex global problems. Sharing a link or signing a petition is simple, but it's too easy to disengage from the cause just 10 seconds later. And yet, the street protests grew together with the global viral trend of Black Lives Matter activism online. We saw phone footage of toppling statues, screenshots of bail fund donations, protest guides flooding Twitter and Instagram. The momentum has carried well into this year, answering the question if online movements can last. And yet, we still hear voices asking whether social media has changed activism for the better. We all know at least someone, and you may be one of these people, that dismisses online activism. I've been told it's an ineffective, a waste of time, and been offered better ways to be an activist without using social media. I've even met people who believe that displaying support for certain causes is just a way to grow your personal brand. Let's start by looking back before the internet. Movements were far slower to grow. It took a year of organization to make the 13 month long Montgomery bus boycott a reality, beginning with Rosa Parks' famous act of resistance. The civil rights movement took a decade of protests and activism to be big enough to attempt the March on Washington. Back then, it was difficult to recruit and retain passionate people. This meant that only the largest and best supported movements could ever thrive. 
Today's world of digital activism is broad-reaching and immediate, compared to traditional methods of activism. What's astonishing is how many movements have been able to flourish. For example, Saudi women fighting for their right to drive cars through social media, young people taking a stand on global period poverty and having taxes removed through social media, and Native American communities exerting political pressure through cultural websites. Nowadays, digital spaces like Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok are being used to develop our civic identities, to express our political views in a new and creative way. The key difference between Generation Z civic engagement and older traditional forms is the easy entry point. Today, anyone can make super scalable content. We're able to adopt an approach to civic engagement that blends both digital and real life actions. We think of it as our digital citizenship. Fundamentally different from the traditional media of televisions, newspapers and films, social media allows us what is called participatory culture. In other words, it allows us to choose what we engage with and shape our own ideas based on our experiences. We become the curators of what's important rather than any one editor or company. And that is a big shift. These symbolic digital participatory acts can be thought of as moments of claiming our voice. Though on the surface, acts of voice may seem trivial and discontented, these acts are the foundation of our digital civic engagement. Young people who engage in digital politics are much more likely to engage in offline pol political participation, such as voting, provided that they have three things, access to technology and digital skills, civic education, and a platform for activism. It's been proven that educating young people on civic issues at an early age is crucial to creating socially woke adults and a sense of social empowerment can help boost the self-esteem and well-being of young people, a hugely pressing issue for Generation Z. For many movements, one of the most important shifts has been from in-person activism to online action. Digital venues offer new opportunities for growth, in Hong Kong, for example, activists have used the popular online multiplayer game Animal Crossing to spread pro-democracy messaging. We've also witnessed new forms of collective action organized online, such as flash mobs like the hashtag clap for carers here at home. Even anti-government protests in Tunisia, Egypt and Ecuador were in part organized and promoted via Facebook. Here's a fact that may surprise you. In recent years, Young people's participation in traditional measures of civic engagement, such as voting or joining a political party, has been steadily declining overall in Western democracies. Here's another fact that might surprise you. Generation Z say that their investment in digital networking, protest and volunteerism are actually through the roof. In other words, collectivism is likely the catalyst for rising political action. With all that out the way, what are the benefits of collectivism? There are some obvious ones. Scale, speed, efficiency, and the ability to reach across borders and raise awareness and funds. Facebook and YouTube have proved ideal for sharing a diverse range of subjects, many of which would otherwise be overlooked by the mainstream. They can play a major part in turning just a fringe cause into a global movement. Secondly, online activism is also more accessible. Those with disabilities were historically excluded from physical protest. Those in rural areas also rarely made their voices heard on national issues. Online, they have an equal voice. There is no medium that allows for this sense of community, just like collectivism does. However, there are two sides to every story. Online movements can burn out faster than campaigns that spend months or even years forging in-person connections, and there is rarely a well-oiled permanent organization to follow up on protesters' demands. Some even argue that the digital playing field is tilted towards dictators and disadvantages movements in several important ways. Many dictators tightly control their country's internet service providers. This allows them to easily monitor, censor, and selectively prevent activists from getting and maintaining internet access. India's control over the internet is comparable to some of the world's most authoritarian countries. 
Yes, while India ranks second in the world in terms of mobile internet subscribers, the country also leads in internet shutdowns to control protesters. And of course, regimes can flood the online space with government propaganda, as they did in Serbia and Honduras in direct response to anti-government protests. Going forward, really effective protests will require not just the right of people to gather, but accessible public spaces in which gathering is possible. Protesters in countries such as China, Russia and Turkey have been arrested by the thousands and their right of assembly removed. In answer to a blanket ban on protests in Spain back in 2015, activists resorted to protest by hologram. 18,000 people set in holograms of themselves protesting, which were then projected in front of Congress on a loop for several hours. Sadly, the phenomenon of shrinking civic spaces appears to continue and digital replicas are just an addition, not a substitute. Despite all the hurdles, many notable activist causes of the past decade are still recognised by their online presence. In 2010, a huge earthquake hit Haiti. The Red Cross were able to garner 2.2 million tweets and raise $20 million in a single week. At one point, they were receiving 10 thousand texts per second and went on to raise 500 million dollars in total. I mean who could forget when one out of every six Brits participated in the ice bucket challenge raising 220 million dollars for ALS research. We haven't even begun to discuss the Me Too movement yet which amongst everything else connected 3600 people with lawyers and raised 24 million dollars to support their efforts on the back of 20 million tweets. And finally my favourite 14-year-old campaigner, Lucy Gavahan. Her petition asked Tesco to stop selling eggs from caged hens, which made up 43% of the eggs they sold each year. With many signatures and shares on social media, Tesco announced that they would phase out eggs from caged hens by 2025. Some of the most successful movements used online activity to rally support and then combined this with the legwork on the ground, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. The 2019 climate strike movement is an incredibly successful example of this combination of online and offline activism. Rallying behind Greta Thunberg and Fridays for Future, tens of millions of citizens all over the world mobilised to address the climate crisis and support environmental activism. But is there any correlation between likes and donations and volunteering? Well, studies have shown that given the easy and efficient nature of clicktivism, it does increase the desire for performing other, more difficult behaviours, including money donations and volunteering. Studies have also shown that young people who engage strongly in politics online also do so in their offline lives. So sharing and tweeting politics on social media does in fact correlate with attending political meetings, donating to campaigns, votings and other forms of civic engagement. At the end of the day, is limited action not always better than no action at all? Well, a Greenpeace activist once said, dismissing weak ties because they're not strong would be about as stupid as turning down a kid wanting to empty his piggy bank to donate because we need more money than he can give. That would be insulting and frankly counterproductive. So, what do I think the future of collectivism looks like? Well, I feel that there is a lot of room for gamification style features, competitive reward based systems and more overt acknowledgement when sharing positive change across social media. We all love a bit of praise after all. We know that it takes a minimum of seven exposures to something to produce action. Therefore, we may need more incentives to share social change at a higher frequency than ever before as a way to build and broaden awareness. What if Instagram allowed you to tag and measure your socially conscious posts and stories, enabling you to track your weekly contribution? We could create a global ripple effect every week and Instagram could share data on how local areas are truly benefiting from these mentions. Yes, it's collectivism, but it will help people in need of support, increase awareness and amplify all that is good in the world. So where does this leave us today? The impact of social media on activism cannot be understated. What was once impossible is now possible. 
efforts that once required mass mobilizations of door knockers can now be achieved in an instant with a well-placed tweet. The internet is now the front line and activists must prioritize online messaging or otherwise have their messaging regulated for them. You've all heard the saying, the pen is mightier than the sword. Well, the power of the click has now joined the fight. Online actions can change a country's policies, drag criminals to court and bring a sea of people out onto the streets in a matter of hours. The key is doing it together. Social media is now the most powerful tool of communication and its users are helping activists to build communities, raise awareness and mobilize. It helps activists to both act and to react. Criticism of social media activism comes largely from those who haven't found their voice online and from those who are seeing their megaphone taken away by new voices in the conversation. It's a classic case of the generation gap. They do not understand that our words, our data, our clicks online help connect us all with those in power. And this is exactly how a democracy works. We know that today's activists won't be satisfied with mere digital activism. If we're to achieve lasting impacts through our efforts, then this generation must pass the sometimes unfocused energy of digital media and combine it with long-standing principles for building and sustaining social campaigns. But it's difficult to argue that being online hasn't had an impact on the number of people willing to show up for a cause. As someone 15 years younger than the internet, its universal influence has directly shaped the way that I and others born into the online generation engage with social change. For some like me, it makes activism without the ability to connect using social media completely unimaginable. Use your media to grow awareness. Use your voice to bring attention. Use your privilege to drive purpose. And use your time on this planet to create positive social change at scale by harnessing the power of collectivism. Thank you.